Okay, so today I want to start talking about checklists. So this is one of the key things we'll, we'll now that we're starting to um, go fly and do that kind of stuff, we want to start talking about what checklists are and the importance of checklists. As you guys know, every time we're getting ready to go out, we, we're going to go through a certain uh, number of steps, checking the, the infrastructure, checking the the processes, all that kind of stuff that go along with um, operation of one of these units. And sometimes that might be a computer-based thing. Sometimes that's going to mean, you know, touching, feeling, uh, looking at the uh, the unit or the environment. Increasingly, I think this is a really important skill. Um, piloting is an important skill, but increasingly over the next couple of years, piloting is going to be less and less important because we're going to have more autonomous control. You'd, you should still be able to safely navigate one of these vessels, but um, I think it's a checklist are going to become, become even more important as stuff seems to become more turnkey. As things seem to be simplified, it's going to be easier and easier to rely on the crutch of something that's not you saying that the the situation is okay to operate these units. And you really have to fight that. You really have to fight that. As with anything we do, using machetes uh, to go through some, uh, you know, giant Arundo or flying drones or driving a car, whatever it is, right now you're pretty safe. Right now you guys are freaked out. Right now you're like, well, how do I do this? I'm not too good at this, right? And, and so we're very much paying attention. Hey, what does this thing do? What does that thing do? The most dangerous time is in a few weeks from now. When you're kind of, you, yeah, you got it flowing. I remember I do this and that, right? It's like just after you get your driver's license, same kind of thing, right? Like, hey, that's good. And the first day you're super chill. And then pretty soon you start um, getting a little over assured, a little cocky. And that's when we typically see um, the accident rates uh, spike. There's all kinds of things we can do for that. One is to be really consistent with how we... Um, uh, again, you guys are still learning how to operate things, but once we get that, that stuff down, we should really be consistent with how we approach e operation every single time. Whether it's a quick 10 minute flight out here, whether it's a, a, a longer duration thing in, in some other region of the world or whatever, let's always follow these, these safety guidelines. A little break here. I wanna pick some different examples so we don't have to worry about drones and we can talk about examples in the conceptual sense. So let's talk about um, a group of folks that are supposedly smart, doctors, not my kind of doctor, the fake doctor, the medical doctor, right, that kind of doctor. <laughs> if we talk about those guys, you know, doctors go to school for a long time, spend a lot of money studying a lot of uh, techniques and, and a lot of maladies and this and that. And so we go to a, a doctor because uh, he or she is, is an expert in um, making us, supposedly making us feel better, right? And so we invest a lot of confidence in, in these folks and we, we are um, generally pretty confident that they're going to take actions that will benefit us. So um, nobody's perfect, of course. And so um, in the last couple of decades, people have started to look more closely at, at problems in the medical industry, in the healthcare industry. And so we'll look at one here, which is from Harvard. These guys looked at about uh, 30,000, the, the, the charts after patients were, were done with their treatment, looked at about 30,000 charts from um, a bunch of hospitals in New York City in 1984. And this is, this is one of the first studies to really highlight this in the modern era. And they found that uh, about 3% or about 4% of the patients overall had some problem that either um, made them stay in the hospital, you know, significantly longer than they otherwise either they would have been discharged, um, and or that actually led to some really bad stuff, so that they maybe got some kind of infection or something that that that, that crippled them. Seventy percent of these problems that that led to the longer being in inside the hospital uh, weren't an accident, but they were. They were an error. So they were the results of an incorrect judgment when someone had a judgment. This wasn't someone accidentally tripping and, and falling and breaking a leg. This was where someone said, we could go down path A or B. Let's go down B. And B was the, was the wrong path. And, and, and objectively so. And looking at the chart, you can see it was pretty clear that, ah, you know, that, that they totally shouldn't have done that. 
Does that mean 69% of the 4%? Yes, correct. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, not 69% of the 30,000, but 69% of the 4%. That's still pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, one more example here, same kind of idea, looking at an Australian example. And here these guys looked at same kind of thing, patient records, charts when people were, were uh, done with their medical uh, uh, stays in hospitals. They looked at 28 uh, hospitals in New South, South Wales and South Australia um, a decade later. And uh, they found that about 17% of the patients had some kind of problems with uh, 13, and, and that broke down into 13% or basically 14% of the folks had some significant disability from that and about 5% of the people died. And uh, in this case, about 50% of the 17% um, were again caused by objectively <coughs> accessible errors. So again, um, not just happenstance or something that we, we hadn't imaged, but, but something that truly was um, a wrong decision that someone in the, in the chain of healthcare made. And so again, doctors are supposed to be smart, right? So let's talk about, let's talk about errors and, 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 and problems. So just to be standard, just to be a little more consistent, here are some, some general numbers. So encounters, that would mean sometimes somebody interacted with the thing. So we could talk about um, a, a relatively safe rate is when we have problems less than one in a hundred one in a hundred thousand times of engaging in that activity. So that would include things like operating nuclear power plants or, or people servicing nuclear power plants. That would be uh, railroads running on, on tracks in Europe. That would be uh, modern air, uh, air travel in terms of commercial air travel. Uh, so that's pretty good, right? So that's, that's uh, fairly rare. Um, we could talk about uh, uh, one death in less than 100,000 people, but in terms of in terms of interacting with, um, in terms of interacting with different things, uh, folks are much more likely to get an accident, or much more likely to have problems when they're driving, or actually in our refineries, especially our, our petroleum refineries. Those, those are pretty dangerous places. Very, very incredibly complex systems, and hard to know. And 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 because of regulations and various <laughs> things, um, we haven't, we don't necessarily build a lot of of chemical plants all the time so the ones we have are pretty darn old and so we we have the problem of aging infrastructure and all this and that so so chemical plants are dangerous driving on u.s roads are dangerous but actually even more dangerous than that would be bungee jumping i don't know if you, is anybody here bungee jumped no you guys are all super conservative okay that's, that's good uh, anybody mountain climb okay there you go a couple a couple mountain climbers there you go you guys are totally you're, you're totally responsible you're so dangerous and then uh Healthcare, right? Healthcare, this thing that where we have folks that train for years and years and years and years to, to deliver what is supposed to be, you know, high quality, fantastic, great outcome kind of stuff. And so uh, I would suggest in the context of today's discussion that one of the reasons why nuclear power plants and railroads and commercial air lines are safer than, than these other things. Um, you know, obviously going up in a tin can th thousands of feet in the air, that's not necessarily an inherently safe thing, right? You can imagine all the possible things that could go wrong. And uh, or is that a, some, okay, hold on. So in the context of today's lecture, what I would posit is while there are many things that possibly could be going on, um, it's not just the fact that these things are inherently um, safe, right? A, nu a, a radionuclide nuclide in, a, in a pool of water, hmm, maybe that's not super safe, right? Just ask the people in Fukushima, right? Um, uh, flying in a tin can, you know, crazy high up in the atmosphere, that's not inherently necessarily a safe thing. But the problem rate is relatively low. And in the context of today's lecture, one of the things, and one of the differences between those top, those top three examples and the bottom three examples, I would suggest, this isn't the case for everybody, but in general, the people on the top go through very rigorous checklists every single time, get in the cockpit, every single time we get in the, 
behind the behind the uh, engineer's station on the train, what have you, versus bungee jumping, maybe, but not always. I used to run a ropes course when I was uh, your guy's age, and and I'll just say I didn't always go through the checklist every single time. <laughs> I sort of did, but not every single time. Um, and, and then healthcare, right? And ultimately what we're talking about here is a difference in culture. The, the folks running the nuclear power plant aren't necessarily stupid. They're not necessarily geniuses. Same thing with, with healthcare, not necessarily stupid, not necessarily geniuses. They're human beings in both of these systems. The difference is people were explicitly worried about committing error and, and the potential uh, risk to many people at one point in time on those on the the top examples and so therefore we're really really you know not just maybe going to hurt one person or two people or five people or ten but maybe hundreds or thousands great it's also going to be yourself if you're the pilot going through the checklist you don't want to crash and burn if you're the doctor you don't care if you mess up a little bit on a surgical operation. Uh, sure so there should be some self-serving protection in there i would agree in concept although increasingly I find, for example, the folks that uh, live underneath the base of the Oroville Dam, those folks were, there were some problems there. The Army Corps of Engineers, that, that their argument was, well, we live in New Orleans too, um, so therefore we didn't commit an error when I would suggest they, they uh, were, by and large, massively irresponsible in terms of that stuff. So, so in general, yes, but in general, I think you're right. Yeah, if you really think about it, hey, I don't want to die, right? I want to be... I want to. I want to make sure that the activity I'm get engaged in isn't going to be a risk to myself. Agreed. Um, but uh, I think sometimes we trick ourselves. Um, in in um, when we when we've had a relatively safe or at least not obviously accident prone condition, we sometimes trick ourselves into thinking that we're safer or behaving more safely uh, than we are. So. And now, while there's many potential other differences between these, these groups of, of um, activities, the simple thing we can do are start to use things like checklists, right, to force us to go through certain things every single time. Doesn't take much time. Doesn't take much, much you know, uh, expenditure of dollars. You don't lose much time in terms of downtime, but you, there's potentially massive savings. So doctors especially surgeons have been very uh very anti checklists and so one of the new movements well <laughs> i don't know in in i believe we still have the affordable care act in in place one of the aspects of that was to encourage folks was to encourage folks to, to doctors and hospitals to use more checklist type things specifically because of data like this Specifically because that can, um, while there are many ways to improve outcomes, it, that is a relatively cheap, relatively simple thing to go forward. Should be easy. It's had a lot of culture clash in, in hospitals and, and uh, medical providers because doctors basically say, dude, I'm super smart. I don't need this. I'm not, I'm not some stupid pilot. Right? I've heard, I heard a guy say one time. Um, and, and, you know, I'm different. You know, I went to blah, blah, blah medical school, right? So that arrogance is incredibly dangerous, incredibly dangerous. We should all be humble. I screw up, you guys screw up. We should all acknowledge that. And we use checklists as one of our tools to combat us forgetting stuff, right? I, when I get home, I have to put my keys uh, one of the reasons I have, one of the reasons you guys hear me jingling everywhere I walk around is I put my, my keys on the carabiner because otherwise I will lose my keys. I guarantee I will lose my keys. So when I get home, I take my keys off my pocket and I put them in, my, in the drawer next to the, next to the garage because if I don't, I guarantee I will not find my keys, right? So that's, I'm just lame that way. And, and so I need to be on this routine Otherwise, I get screwed. And if I'm carrying in some big object or something and I'm doing something, I put my key down, I'll have a thought like, oh, dude, I shouldn't have put my keys there. And then whatever, carry the thing. And then sure enough, the next day I'm going to school. I'm like, where's my keys? Where's my keys? Where's my keys? Right. So, so we all need to, to sort of check ourselves. A um, uh, little bit of data for us here. Um, this is from last year's survey. And, and, and there are problems with this. This isn't 
there, there's some things here. So, so uh, this is of folks that flew in the last six months, uh, operated a UAV. Um, we asked them how many flights did they, they fly? And so uh, this, this is our subset of folks that are UAV you know, familiar. And this isn't the, the you know, Joe Blow general population, but people that are, that are familiar, that, that do own a drone, et cetera, that kind of stuff. Um, we find that they have on average uh, about 81 flights, but, it's, but it's, it's pretty variable. Some are flying all the time, some are not. We have a median of about 30 flights in the previous uh, six months, so that's about five or so a month. That's about a flight or so on average a week. Um, and what we see is uh, the the crash rate. If we if we just take the gross, uh, and this isn't necessarily the best way to do it, but if we just take the gross uh, average, we're talking about a 10% crash rate. Now that's probably an overestimate, but but nevertheless, that that's what we have. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that. That it was it was equivalent to death or those other things that we were talking about in, in this situation, but it does point out that you know these things do do flop, do do you know go boom sometimes. Um, sometimes it's because of the wind. Sometimes because of it's a, me a mechanical failure. We didn't we didn't you know uh, we, we didn't nor are we this year asking where where the source of that crash was. Um, and we don't certainly didn't, don't ask if anybody died or whatever. That's obviously going to be way, way, way lower. But I would suggest that one of the things that would probably help lower even that 10% is to be more rigorous with things like checklists. So again, we all make errors. It, it, it's, we're human beings. And so rather than deny that we make errors, let's just say, hey, our goal is to minimize stuff. So this drives me crazy with the kind of stuff that we do in our increasingly litigious society. The fact that there's any risk will send, will send some people through the roof. They go, oh, I can't do it. So we're trying to acquire another drone, I'm getting ready to buy another drone uh, for you guys, and um, tried to buy it last week and a, uh, how do I say this? Uh, a member of the administration said, oh no, you can't use a pro we have we have university credit cards. Can't use university credit card to buy a drone. So like what? Yep. Nope. Nope. Can't. Nope. 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 Drones dangerous. And so it's taken a week of emails and talking to higher up administrators, etc., to determine that there is no policy. That 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 person basically just made that up, right? And I don't think they were trying to hurt us per se or or be ill ill advised, but. It, it's this notion that what we do is, in, is inherently risky, right? By far, when we go and do stuff, when you guys go and do stuff, by far, on average, the most dangerous thing you're going to do is get in your car and drive to the site where we're going to fly. Nobody seems to worry about that, though, right? <laughs> like, they're fine with you guys doing that. But we want to get a drone, whoa, whoa, a, a class in which we're trying to talk about safety and trying to have you guys have practice of safe operation that's whoa inherently dangerous another one that we have problems with scuba diving right so so research scuba diving uh and much safer than driving a car and yet every time we every time like a new administrator comes in like well that scuba diving is pretty dangerous right it's this perception of risk versus versus the the, the actual facts and i know we're in an era of alternative facts but but you guys are not allowed to use alternative facts. You need to look at risks as they truly are. And, and again, one way that we can help minimize this, not eliminate, we should never say that this stuff will eliminate risk, but it, 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 can, it can help reduce problems by going through um, a proper checklist. Um, and again, uh, uh, many reasons why, why that, that health, those healthcare examples were where they were, but I would argue one of the biggest ones that's easiest to correct is I'm an expert and I know better, right? We, you, you guys will be experts, um, or at least well on your way to being experts at the end of this class, but you should never say, and I know better than you. If someone has some, someone says something, hey, let's hear what, you, what is your concern? Maybe I can improve uh, my operation. Um, and again, we just said this, but healthcare hasn't tried to make itself safe. Um, 
we want, I, I would argue right now that probably in most cases UAV operators are safer than um, private pilots. People might disagree with me, but I would say I think that's probably true. Uh, Joe Blow, random person driving a car, and actually safer than most healthcare um, things, based on on those just a couple. Old, those are old statistics, but but things haven't got a, a lot better. They've actually gotten worse in recent years. Um, and as but one example, so this was a couple weeks ago, right? Here's Han Solo, uh, almost landing on an American Airlines airplane at uh, down at the airport in Orange County. So. You know, I'm not trying to pick on Han Solo and all, he's cool and all, but um, really, right? Yeah. So we're sweated because people perceive us as being a, a risky actor or something that's a threat, but um, you know, I, I, we, I can sit here all day and point out private, uh, uh, privately operated aircraft accidents that happen. And, and my point is not to demonize other folks, the point is just to say, hey, we should talk about the risks in a real sense, and that we are being responsible by trying to minimize our risks at all times. Okay, so what we're going to start with is this. I have a copy for everybody. You guys pass these around. Oops, sorry. That's good. So this is our starter checklist. Okay, so this is, this is just our, a first draft checklist. Uh, just to sort of get your juices flowing. Um, uh, in general, we want to have a, a general checklist that we basically go through every time. And then, um, depending on the particular craft, there might be some additional, some additional uh, boxes or, 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 or routines we need to go through, right? So there might be something slightly different on the um, fixed wing. So for example, you might hook it up and test to make sure the flaps are working, right? Whereas we wouldn't necessarily do that on the uh, quad, uh, qu a quadcopter, et cetera. But in general, we, we wanna start with having a generic uh, checklist that's gonna uh, make sure that, that we operate safely. So this is, my, this is my starter one for you guys. Um, so what I wanna do is, is take a break for a second. I want you guys to read through this, and then we're gonna uh, have you guys start to work on, on augmenting this and starting to to add on additional things. So, okay, so we'll take a couple minutes. You guys, you guys look over that. 